Please welcome to the stage Deidre Fleming, Nicholas Lund, and Doug Hitchcock. again, both of you, for joining us for Maine Voices Live. Thanks for having us. I wanted to start uh, this conversation by um, saying that I've been reporting on the outdoors in Maine for almost 20 years. And in the last few years, this strange thing started to happen. It happened, started around April 2017. Somebody at Maine Audubon, maybe it was Doug, contacted me at the paper and said, there's this really unusual event that occurred this week. There's two rare birds that have been in Maine. Um, one was the vermilion flycatcher in, on Hog Island in Bremen, and then two days later, a um, field fair. A field <laughs> fair, thank you, was was seen in Damascata, and uh, he said it's very unusual that two rare birds in the same week. So I went to the editors and I told them, and they got all excited, and they said, "Can you get that story for tomorrow's front page?" I said, "Yeah, that's no problem." So I found people who had been in Damascata. I found people who had been in Bremen. Interviewed them on the phone. They sent a photographer to Damascata for the birders looking for the field fair, which is native to northern Europe and Asia. So it was very unusual that it was here, and uh, it w ran on the front page. And if memory serves, both rare birds were on the banner on the Portland Press Herald. So then four months later, in uh, September 2017, again, I get Doug contacts me from Maine Audubon and says, there's another rare bird in Maine. It is the... Uh, Fork-tailed fly. Fork flycatcher, thank you. But who's counting? And ironically, it's at Gilsland Farm. So there are people here and people come from, coming from all around New England to see this bird. So I go, I tell the editors, and again, they want the front page story. Can you, can you drop what you're doing and go there and do a story? Sure, that's no problem. I go to Gilsland Farm with photographer Jill Brady. She got an amazing photo with Doug's help of a fork-tailed flycatcher. And it ran, the photo ran really big on the front page. So a year later in August 2018, last August, when Doug contacts me, or maybe it was Jeremy Klukey, who used to be with Maine Audubon, communication director, who I believe is here tonight. Uh, one of the two contacted me and said, there is a, this great black hawk in Maine, in Biddeford, very rare, only the second time it's been seen in the United States, first time in Maine. So I tell the editors, and they want a front page story. At this point I said, either to Doug or Jeremy, and I said, you folks at Maine Audubon should ride this horse as long and hard as you can, because I don't know how long the editors are gonna want birding stories on the front page. <laughs> but I go to Biddeford, and sure enough, there's a, people from as far away as Arizona, there was a woman from the Midwest who was having a big bird year. There are two guys who had driven from upstate New York overnight to see this great black hawk. So by November, when Doug tells me that the, the great black hawk had settled in Deering Oaks Park, and the editors again want coverage of it. In January, this past January, when the bird falls out of the tree and is rescued by a local woman and brought to Avian Haven, and news editor John Richardson says, can you drop what you're doing? Find the woman who rescued the great black hawk. We want it for the front page tomorrow. We have to get that story. And, and through Facebook, I found the woman who rescued the great black hawk. She might be here tonight. Is she here? She's a hero. <laughs> At that point, I realized two things after the great Black Hawk rescue story. One, the editors know what they're doing. And two, all those birding organizations around the country that say birding is the fastest growing outdoor activity in the United States are probably right. This past winter, I did a story on the growing number of birding festivals in Maine. And in fact, US Fish and Wildlife reported in its last national survey of outdoor recreation that in 2016, the last time US Fish and Wildlife did the survey, birders outnumbered fishermen and hunters. And 15 years ago, when I started as an outdoor reporter, just after I started as an outdoor reporter, US Fish and Wildlife Service only does this national survey every five years. They hadn't, 15 years ago, they didn't separate out birders. It was just wildlife watchers. So now birders get their own, org, their own category in this national survey. So, but, so this was not always the case. And I'd like you gentlemen to start with why you started birding when you did and what it was like back then when you started as birders. For Doug, you were a senior at Bonnie Eagle High School. It was 12 years ago. And for you, Nick, it was uh, 14 years ago, you were a senior at Hamilton College in upstate New York. Yep. T t 
share with us why you started birding and what it was like for you when you started. Uh, I started because it's fun as heck. I started because it's fun. Um, <clears throat> birding was not something that I was aware of growing up. Um, I grew up in a very outdoors family uh, of hunters and fishermen, uh, which was wonderful. It meant I was outdoors all the time and seeing lots of things and doing lots of things. Um, but none of it clicked with me um, the way it should have, I think. And so I was a senior in college. I was in a used bookstore in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I saw a bird field guide on the shelf, and I picked it off. And some old lady in Florida, I gathered, um, had written next to each bird where she had seen them and the date. And I just was like, that's cool. And so I bought that book, and I crossed off all her things. <laughs> and, I, uh, had, and a switch flipped in me and said, that's, this is sort of a lifetime journey of uh, exploration and discovery and, um, and seeing all kinds of different habitats. And uh, it just immediately struck me as something that I wanted to do forever. And so I still have that book. Um, it's, it's, it's tattered now. But, um, and so it's been, that, it's been that since then. Yeah, yeah for me, it was uh, through photography. I'd, I'd gotten my first camera, um, which is a great uh, kind of intro to, to birds for a lot of people. I think the, the Main Birds Facebook group is a great kind of testament to that, the, the amount of people just taking photos of birds in their backyard. Um, uh, I remember that, you know, I, I had photographed this chipping sparrow in uh, my parents' yard uh, growing up and being able to, you know, look in the field guide, match up the field marks. I identified it as a clay-colored sparrow, you know, all sparrows, little brown jobs. Um, and then, like, saw the range maps and knew that I must have been wrong. Um, and sure enough, you know, eventually found out chipping sparrow. And it was that whole investigative process that... Um, was just so so interesting to me, and after you know a couple months of that, I found uh, Maine Audubon. You know, trying to find where could I find more birds. I had run out the list in my backyard, and they had the the weekly rare bird alert that came out every Friday or something. And um, in it, it talked about an ash throated flycatcher, which you should have to go to Arizona if you want to see one. And one had shown up at this um, little yacht club in Saco, right down by the river. And in it, it said that the, um, the Ashwood flycatcher continues for the second week. It's been seen on the you know, 13th, 14th. No one saw it on the 15th. It was back on the hillside by the 16th. And this is the seventh record of one in the state of Maine. And the fact that there were um, one that this bird had you know, flown thousands of miles uh, the wrong way. But there were people. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to write down the road from, from where I was. Um, and then there, that there was this community of people like keeping track of it and knowing that this was the seventh time, and um, I, I knew I wanted to be a part of that. But 12 years ago and 14 years ago, when you started birding, you didn't see a, a whole lot of people who were 18 and 20, 22 at the time? No. I didn't see anybody for years. Uh, <laughs> It's actually one of the kind of nice things about birding is that you can just go outside your house and you're birding. And so for a long time, uh, I, that's all I did. I would go for walks and did everything on my own without seeing anyone. Um, when I did see people, um, yeah, they were not uh, 22 for the most part. Um, to the point when I saw Doug, and the way I remember it is I saw you at Evergreen Cemetery across the pond. And I wanted to like run across the pond <laughs> to find you, to be like, what are you doing here? Um, and it was obvious that he was birding? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we, unless we he's standing in a cemetery uh, <laughs> by himself, which I probably should have talked to him anyway, because that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it was clear he was, he was birding. Yeah. And I remember when, when we finally did connect was at uh, Pine Point. I had gone down to the dock. I, I was trying to photograph some duck or something. And was you know so intent looking through the camera, and then like looked up, and there you were with binoculars, and I was like, "You're you're young." Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we we ended up birding together that afternoon, going down to like Biddeford Pool. You were on your way down to Boston, and I just like followed you until you were <laughs> kind of out of the state. Uh, yeah, that was weird. Such that a great a bro weird. love story. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. <laughs> yeah. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Yeah. So birders are known to go to these extreme. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. 
birders are known to go to these extremes to see rare birds. Talk about some of the exotic trips you've gone on for birding and some, and some of the trips you've taken at the last minute to kind of drop everything and chase a rare bird. Uh, I'll start. Doug has better stories than I do, but I'll start by saying one of the wonderful things about birding is that you need to take these trips. I mean, one of the things about birding is that a bird can show up anywhere at any time. And if you want to see it, you have to leave work or your family and go there. Um, and I love that part of it. Um, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, that, yeah. That doesn't, that, I can see how that would sound funny. I, I, uh, not that part. But I, I love the spontaneity of it and the travel of it. Um, but you've done some good ones. Yeah, so visiting, uh, you know, it's, it's these exotic places, and it's not just, um, uh, you know, there, there's so many beautiful places around the country, national parks and things that, that people want to travel to, but sometimes the best birding is, you know, the parking lot to those national right. parks rather than whatever the, the scenery is. So um, One of the best spots in Maine is the Pell Reco building, which is down in... Uh, Scarborough Marsh, where you literally, it's, uh, you go and stand on a flatbed truck with all these other trucks behind you and you look over a, a marsh. Now it's a marijuana growing facility. And so when you go bird there, all these, you know, unmarked trucks come up to you and wonder what you're doing. Yeah. They're all paranoid for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, uh, so some of the places, like I, I did a trip out um, to Attu, which is the furthest island out on the Aleutian chain. So Alaska is just, you know, huge, beautiful, so much to see, like, let's get a, as far away from it as possible. Um, so your Attu is, um, it's technically closer to Japan than it is to mainland Alaska, but you're, see, you're seeing North American birds, uh, or, or you're working on your North American list, but you're seeing more Siberian birds than anything else. So, um, yeah. yeah, you never know where it's going to bring you. It and for me, I mean, I've, the, one of the reasons, another reason I love birding is because you need to go everywhere to see all the birds. I mean, the goal is sort of see all the birds. And to do that, you need to go to all the places. And so that means the middle of the ocean, the swamps in Florida, dry tortugas off Florida, the border from, uh, you know, the Rio Grande all the way to Arizona, um, and off the coast in the Pacific to the tundra in Nome, Alaska. These um, are all places you've been? Yeah. Uh, tops of mountains, and you know you. So I've, you see so much of the country and of whatever country you're in um, that it's really sort of rewarding that way. Well, Doug, don't pretend like I'm not going to ask you about Chicago. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, um, a few years ago uh, there was a bird called um, short-billed Alania, which you should. It's a South American flycatcher. It was the first time one had ever been seen. In the U.S., it showed up in uh, Douglas Park, which is kind of downtown Chicago. Um, you could probably buy some great drugs there. Um, it was it was not a nice neighborhood. How do you know um, that? <laughs> I saw I saw a lot. Um, no, it was it was not a nice neighborhood. Um, but the, someone found this rare bird, and this is this is one of the coolest things of birds. You never know where these in insane rare things are going to show up. There's I would have rather been anywhere else in that state. Um, but here we were, uh, another main bird, and I flew into Chicago. The day we arrived was the first day the bird wasn't seen. Um, so we spent two days walking around that park, avoiding certain people, and um, uh, flew back to Maine having a nice trip. My, my, somehow it was a positive experience. It was. Uh, I should say my, my sister was actually living in Chicago at the time. So like there was, I did get to, you know, crash on her couch. Um, so nice to, you know, didn't completely avoid the family. Like, uh, <laughs> Just coincidentally. Though. Yeah, that... So the great black hawk, Doug, you were sort of at the epicenter of the buzz around this bird in Maine. Talk about... Um, that experience and how rare this 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 event was in Maine birding that it was here for so long and there was such excitement around it and it was in such a public place. Yeah, so it, it goes back to April of last year. Um, there was uh, a birder, Alex Lamaru, who was down in uh, South Padre, Texas, a bit you know one of the best places to be looking for birds as they're migrating back north, and he was at this hawk watch and saw this raptor go overhead, fired off photos of it, um, and, I and knew it was one of these, 
one of the Black Hawks eventually figured out it was Great Black Hawk, which was the first time one had ever been seen in the United States. He watched it for like 40 minutes or something as it circled around being mobbed by crows, and then it flew off and was never seen again. So, so that was big news in the birding world. You know, anytime a first you know U.S. record shows up, um, everyone's uh, super envious. Months go by, um, as you said earlier, it was in August, all of a sudden um, a photo pops up on this Facebook group called uh, What's This Bird, uh, appropriately named, and it was a woman who had photographed this great black hawk in Biddeford, um, right by Fortune's Rocks, uh, and um, yeah, it ended up being the exact same bird by looking at, um, we eventually relocated it a couple days later, and then it was only seen for two days in Biddeford, and good enough photos were taken, we could see the patterning of these feathers on the underside of the wing called the, the underwing primary coverts, um, and there's very intricate little patterns on them, um, and we could match Alex's photos from April to these photos that were taken in August, and it's essentially like looking at the fingerprint of the bird, um, and they perfectly matched. So we knew that same bird had traveled the whole way here, uh, much to the chagrin of all the birders between Texas and Maine uh, that missed the bird. So it disappeared for um, uh, a few more months, and then uh, it was eventually photographed off the Eastern Prom at the end of October. And then almost a full month later was when it was finally found in Deering Oaks. Um, and that's where it then stayed for at least three more months into January. Um, and thousands of people got to come see it uh, in that time. You led some school groups on tours there. It became almost like the resident bird. Yeah, so I was um, uh, very lucky to, you know, <laughs> to live in Portland, live so close to it, to be able to get there almost every single day. The first day um, we were there, we had actually, it was a Thursday, we had done our bird walk at Gillsland Farm. Um, I think someone like either sent me a screenshot of it, it was again posted on a Facebook group, and so we ran right down there. And it was in Deering Oaks, right across the street from King Middle School. And we, uh, Maine Audubon does a lot of work with King Middle School, so I was actually texting teachers like, there's this amazing bird <laughs> outside, like you need to get your kids out here. and. Um, to the credit of, of those teachers um, for that, that Thursday and then again on Friday in between classes. So when the kids were, were switching, they would bring groups of the students out and I'd just have the scope set up for them so all the kids got to come through. The best was uh, on Friday, one girl looked through the scope, looked at the bird and she said, she was like, the bird's been here for a while. <laughs> so, Hmm. Um, and, and it probably had been, uh, which was uh, pretty awesome that, that she probably had seen that bird longer than anyone else had. And while you're very well known among Maine birders across the state and very highly regarded, that bird sort of made you famous among middle schoolers. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you say they'd come up to you in the supermarket? And uh, I, I was recognized once. <laughs> um, the best was... Uh, uh, we had the, the King Middle School um, brought some of their students to Evergreen Cemetery um, this spring. We were doing some bird walks with them, and one of the teachers said, um, you know, in prepping the kids, they said, oh, you're going to get to meet a, a celebrity. And after they introduced me, after I birded with them, I heard one of the kids, you know, walking out say, when do we get to meet the celebrity? <laughs> Nick, you have this, this blog that has a national following, The Birdiest, and you have thousands of followers. So, you know, from your perspective as a birding blogger who's got this huge following, talk about why you think this bird captivated at least the people in southern Maine and greater Portland. <clears throat> there, there is no precedent in, in other parts of life for this thing happening. You know, it would be like a zebra showing up in the woods. Someone's out hunting and they see a zebra. Uh, it's like that. And uh, because birds have wings and they can really go wherever they want, um, this happens occasionally. It's called, called vagrants. Um, this, uh, this, the great blackhawk is, you know, one of the most extreme examples of it really ever. Um, and so when people wrap their, I, their heads around that, this bird, you know, this species has never been seen north of Mexico and, it, you know, spends most of its time in Mexico or Brazil. Um, and now it's just here in Portland, just hanging out and got here on its own. Um, it's just, it's fun and interesting and cool. Um, 
you know, this bird was, was so, you know, this species had probably never seen snow before, you know, in its whole evolutionary history. Um, and so here was, and that's the other thing, this is an individual, um, you know, this is one guy who just decided to fly for whatever reason, flew for thousands of miles, and now ended up in this place far away. It's just, um, it's exciting and interesting and, and weird. And he is a guy, I learned earlier when we were talking that the bird was, uh, requires a special test to figure out which sex the bird is. And Avian Haven, where it was brought after it fell in Deering Oaks Park, did that test. And it, the great black hawk is a he. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he hasn't, he hasn't quite left us. So there's going to be a monument or a <laughs> statue anyway in his honor, depending on how you look at it. And... Um, and his remains are going to be, are being, his taxidermist is mounting him and he's going to be in the Maine State Museum, but there are some people that think maybe he should have been kept closer to southern Maine. So let's have a show of hands. How many people think the Great Black Hawk should have been in, encased at Maine Audubon? Yeah. <laughs> Political. <laughs> Yeah, so it is, it is worth saying that like most, we know that most, uh, most vagrant birds tend to be juvenile males, young birds. Which makes um, sense, right? You know? Yeah, we've all been there. I mean, we didn't even need to tell you that. We all went yeah. to that too. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to tell you that. Um, uh, but there's, there was no precedence for this event where a lot of the, the things like the, even that South American fork, fork-tailed flycatcher that showed up in Falmouth, there, we can explain why. We know, we, we know the errors that the bird made to get here. It's usually a, what's called a mirror image migration, um, wandering, spring overshoots. There, there's a number of Storms, kind of, droughts. Yeah, there's, there's a number of things that cause vagrancy in birds. None of those hold true for the great black hawk, which is what's kind of so bizarre about this and why it probably won't ever happen again. Yeah. But while he will be in the Maine State Museum, he might visit Maine Audubon? Yes. We, we will definitely put in our request to get that mount to come visit uh, Falmouth at some point. Or we'll heist him. <laughs> <laughs> Which and I should it, have said, but... I should mention the uh, Friends of Deering Oak is doing a, a fundraiser right now to help fund the... Um, so there's going to be a, a life-size bronze statue put in the park of the bird, um, and then the part that Maine Audubon is, is um, even more chiming in with is some interpretive signage to kind of talk about the importance of those green spaces in these, these large cities. Um, there's, there's some part to the story that the bird definitely chose that park because of the mature trees, the riparian habitat, the water that was there. Like it, it had, yeah, the abundance of squirrels. Um, <laughs> Fat squirrels. Uh, as well as city rats. rats. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there is kind of a, a greater message to this bird and, and the place that it chose to be um, that really shows the importance of those green spaces. So the main state bird, or the lack of the main state bird, thanks to Nick Lund, who researched this and the fact that the 1927 legislature picked a, just a vague reference to the chickadee without picking yeah. a specific chickadee. We all now know that we don't have a specific state bird. <laughs> Nick, talk about the research you did. And the research. A news, a news story that yeah. some kids in Skowhegan got a hold of and uh, asked their state representative to put in a bill. You went to testify in the legislature. Mm -hmm. Talk about the research you did and, and that sort of the, the conversation around that issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Research is a very generous word for what I did. Um, it was, I think, my first day at Maine Audubon. And you know that day when you start your job and you're just sort of filling out paperwork and you don't really know what to do? I had some downtime and uh, had always, I've always liked state birds and state symbols. I'm very proud to be from Maine. Um, I've known that our state bird was the black-capped chickadee, or assumed it was, or been told that, I, that it was, uh, forever. And it was one of the first birds I ever knew because it was Maine's state bird. Um, and... I have uh, subsequently, I had written an article about the list of state birds, which if you, if you take a look at the list of state birds, it's awful. It's embarrassing. There's no thought put into it. There are duplicates all over the place. There's non-native birds. Um, and so it's, I've always sort of thought about it. And so I was there on my first day at Maine Audubon. It had some downtime. So I thought I'd just look up the law uh, of, about Maine state birds, establishing Maine state bird. Um, and I noticed that the law passed in 1927 said that the state bird shall be the chickadee. And I said, hmm, oh. Um, because I know that there are two chickadees in Maine. 
and there, uh, there was no supporting documents. Um, I actually wrote to the state historian and the state law library to see if there was legislative history possibly indicating which chickadee they had in mind. Both of those chickadees were full species at the time, so they were well known, um, and there was nothing. Uh, and so I just sort of thought, mm, that's, that's interesting. We don't technically have a state bird. Um, I had actually, um, this is nerdy, but I have looked at all 50 states' laws. Um, Maine and Utah are the only ones that don't specify a particular species. Um, and so uh, I, at the end of my first week, I um, was on a boat, and you were on the boat, and I mentioned to you, as I was trying to sort of just make conversation, um, did you know that we don't have a state bird? And you said, oh, really? And I said, uh-oh, this is going to be a big thing now. Um, <laughs> And it was, which is, which is great. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting to me because the two possibilities in Maine are the black-capped chickadee, which uh, is a wonderful bird, uh, lives all over Maine, but it's not particularly unique to Maine. It lives in about 30 other states. Um, so there's nothing particularly Maine about it. Uh, the other option is a bird called the boreal chickadee, uh, which is, lives only in northern Maine, is a little harder to find, but it's also a little hardier uh, and does not live in as many states, lives in only a couple states. Um, Maine is sort of the stronghold for it, I would say, outside of Alaska, which shouldn't, doesn't count. Um, <laughs> and so it's a real debate, I think, about you know, what, what do we want in a state bird? What, uh, do we choose something that is easy to see in your backyard or something that maybe represents us as a people more? Um, do we want to you know, throw a bone to northern Maine when they feel like they get so little? Or do we want a bird that's found in everybody's backyard? Uh, it's an interesting sort of um, debate, I think, uh, with uh, no clear answer. Uh, because uh, Representative Betty Austin from Skowhegan uh, pr uh, proposed a bill in this legislature which didn't offer one solution or another. It said, let's figure it out. Uh, I went up and testified, um, also in, in saying I didn't pick one either on behalf of Maine Audubon, Boreal Chickadee, should be. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but the bill did not pass out of committee. So um, for this session, this year, um, there's no movement on the bill. So it was, until we all get up there and, with our signs and, and uh, demand change. It was killed with a vote by a vote of 10 to, 10 to 0. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting. It was interesting. I tend to think statewide, but if you're a representative who represents a specific district, and I got this from one of the representatives, they said, you want me to vote for a bird that doesn't live in my district? Uh, that's politics, man, that's politics. Um, and so, you know, we, Maine Audubon did not, we did not put a lot of oomph into this. This was something that took on a life of its own. Um, so we didn't lobby, you know, we didn't, you know, put education into it. Uh, and so f we, I did my job, I think, which is to, you know, talk about birds in Maine in a big stage. Um, but we didn't have a dog in the fight necessarily. Um, and we'll see what happens next year. Do you think the issue will come up again? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If you, people want to write some more letters to the editor out there, then we can revive it. So what are some good state birds and what are some poor state birds? Across the country? Across the, across the country. They're mostly awful. They're mostly embarrassing. There are uh, two chickens. Um, <laughs> Delaware and Rhode Island. They don't have very much. You know what I mean? They, they had small pickings to choose from. Um, there, in South Dakota, it's a ring-neck pheasant, which is a non-native introduced species. Um, I think the worst are Texas and Florida, which have the most vibrant bird life of any two states in the country. They have beautiful, you know, uh, roseate spoonbills and crazy warblers that are only found there and seabirds. Uh, both of them have uh, the northern mockingbird, um, which is a very boring bird that is bland looking and it lives everywhere and is just not unique to any of these states. And so um, I, I think this is a chance for Maine to differentiate ourselves. What I should say about the black capped chickadee is that Massachusetts has it, too. So there you have it. <laughs> if it became a citizen's referendum no and we could have any, any yeah. state bird on the ballot, who would you, which bird would you want as the main state bird? Oh, man, what a great question. Um, Oh. So, the, and Doug, jump in. Yeah, what, yeah. Citizens referendum next year. 
So uh, Maine has some great charismatic species. Everyone loves a common loon. It's another widely distributed one. But um, for me, Ad Atlantic puffin, we're the only state that has Atlantic puffins nesting. Um, hey. <laughs> but how many people here are from northern Maine, where there are no Atlantic puffins? Right? Mm -hmm. We're just excluding the whole part of that state, Doug? <laughs> So, Atlantic puffins bring in millions of dollars in tourism dollars per year. Fair. Um, but not to Millinocket, in, they don't. Uh, <laughs> tr trickle down economics, you wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't get it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the, and it will be curious to see as, as the Gulf of Maine is uh, one, you know, the fastest increasing uh, temperature for, for body of water, um, you know, we could lose yeah. species like puffins. So, um, if anything, I hope it, that would at least get people talking about, you know, preserving that important resource. Steve Kresh with National Audubon, who brought the, helped bring the puffins back, he has said that if they stepped away and they didn't do the island stewardship that they do, the puffins population would yeah. Yeah, decline. Yeah, the would eat them all. Sorry. <laughs> we were... Uh, it's dark. Yeah. Yeah, this is getting heavy. We were um, at the Acadia, Doug and I both were at the Acadia Birding Festival this past weekend uh, and took a, part of that was a boat trip um, out to um, Petit, Petit Manan, Manan, which is a big puffin colony. And I was very surprised uh, at the, the number of laughing gulls that are breeding out there. Laughing gulls has traditionally been a southern gull species in the United States. And um, just in the past, what, couple, 20 years, uh, maybe more, uh, has increased their presence in the Gulf of Maine, and in th the island was about half laughing gulls. Um, you know, people think that climate change is something that we that is hap going to happen in the future that we're sort of warding off the effects of, but w when you look at birds in the Gulf of Maine, it's, it's very visible what's happening now, and puffins could be a direct sort of casualty of that. Sorry to take everyone down. No, speaking yeah. of the Acadia Birding Festival, which is at Maine's longest-standing birding festival, and. It's the largest. It's the larging bird, largest birding festival in Maine, and you were the, the speaker. I just learned this tonight, Doug, that I knew you were the speaker there, but you talked earlier about your keynote talk. Share. It just seems it was very interesting and sort of offbeat. Yeah. Um, so the Acadia Festival this year uh, had around 350 people uh, attend it, most of them from out of state. So... Uh, I, mean, I mentioned the number with the puffins, but like uh, we need to realize that you know uh, birds and birding as as a hobby in Maine is uh, actually doing a lot for our local economies, bringing people here. You know, it's a shoulder season in uh, the national park, and there were you know hundreds of people visiting, spending you know going out to eat. Spend, uh, the holy donut on Deering Oaks when that blackhawk was there was <laughs> making raking in the dough, yeah. raking it in. Um, <laughs> I went there like six times. Yeah. <laughs> but your message to them was very different from yeah, so, what you said is currently discussed at yeah, birding so I, festivals. I did the keynote on Saturday night, um, and my topic was, the title I, I gave was Humbled by Birds. Um, and the idea was I, I told a lot of stories. Um, uh, I started with that, that humble feeling that we have when we think about birds and like the amazing migrations that they go through. I showed migration maps of ruby-throated hummingbirds, and that's a bird that's three grams that's making trans-gulf migrants. So like we, we feel humbled in that way when we think about the things that they have to go through. And then um, kind of talked about like uh, more as birders how we need to... Um, I was trying to get people to kind of take it down a peg. Um, to be more humble about, you know, misidentifying birds. Um, I, I hear this all the time with beginner birders as they're, you know, maybe a few months into it and they're starting to, you know, meet people. And, and some people can be a little more uh, competitive with birding. And, and there's almost this, like, stigma around, you know, misidentifications. And, and it's, it's funny because, you know, everyone misidentifies birds probably every day, you know, where... Where you know driving down the highway, you see something for a split second. Like there's, it's just impossible. So, um, so I told stories about the ma the greatest misidentifications I've ever made. Um, uh, rarest bird I've ever found in Maine was uh, correctly identified almost three years later. Yeah, I was um, there. When... <laughs> yeah, I photographed this bird um, on Monhegan Island in October and. Uh, any small rail on Monhegan in October should be a Sora. And I took this photo of it, and um, y years later, the uh, Macaulay Library teamed up with 
uh, uh, eBird through Cornell, where you can now upload. There's something like 35 million photos that have been uploaded to this database now. Um, and I put in this one photo of a weird Sora, and then as I was birding with Nick, <laughs> like and this was a couple years ago, mm-hmm. um, I get this text message from uh, Luke Seitz, this all-star birder from Maine. And he, he texts me and he says, I would have been much more excited about this bird. Um, and you got to see me just And that's when melt. I started taking pictures uh, of you over your shoulder yeah, to and, record the uh, moment. And saw it was a picture of a corn crake, which hadn't been seen in Maine for a couple hundred years. The only, only other record was from, like, late... Um, I used to know the date. But uh, a hunter shot one in Falmouth, uh, like, I think early 1800s or something. Like, just this insane record. <laughs> um, it was the first time one had ever been photographed in the U.S., and I didn't even know it. So, it's a tough uh, idea, to be fair. It was a challenge. Yeah, the, there's a great book called uh, Rare Birds of North America that has a species account for corn crake, and um, under similar species, it says, um, unique enough to not be misidentified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Speaking of the 1800s, I think I might have time for one more question. You both work for the oldest conservation organization in Maine. You yeah. can talk a little bit, or please, Nick, talk a little bit about the history of that. And, you know, so what are your, some of your goals for both of you for the conservation work you hope to do in the future? Yeah, we work for Maine Audubon, uh, which started as the Portland Natural History Society in 1843. Uh, We were down in various buildings here in Portland, um, all of which had burned down at one point or another, um, losing our entire collections. People were um, running out with a passenger pigeon that they had saved a couple times in the 1800s. Um, You know, and back then it was really, this is when people thought that they were like giant dragons in the ocean. Um, And so the goal of a place like us was to really introduce people to Maine wildlife and the world's wildlife and um, sort of introduce that element of celebration and interest and love of wildlife, um, which has um, you know carried through, I think, as a theme to Maine Audubon today. We've joined with uh, what started as the uh, Maine Audubon Society in the early 1900s. This is when, uh, in the late part of the 1800s, of, of course, you know there was wanton hunting of uh, things like egrets and lots of birds that were uh, quickly going extinct because of um, there was no you know regulation on hunting. Um, Audubon societies popped up to try to slow that and were very successful in that, thankfully. Uh, Maine Audubon was one of those, and we joined with um, the, what was the Portland Natural History Society and have carried through to this day. Um, and we still carry on that work. You know, we connect Mainers to Maine wildlife, um, thousands and thousands of, uh, a year, uh, from kids to, you know, uh, old, to adults. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to adults. And... Uh, we're, we're just a great organization. We, we, um, we have a sort of a three-pillared mission, which is um, education, conservation, and advocacy. So we educate, like I said, um, thousands of people. Um, students, Doug leads walks all the time. We're doing seminars and all kinds of things. Conservation, uh, we work to protect uh, plovers on the beach and forestry for Maine birds and help um, you know, stream crossings and culverts and brook trout and loon counts, all kinds of science. We, we have scientists that help... Um, get a sense of how wildlife populations in Maine are doing. And then we take that science and turn it into advocacy. So we're in the state house um, trying to make sure that Maine wildlife is protected. Um, and we've had a great year doing that so far. So um, we're just a great organization and have been for a long time. And it's just good to be a part of it. But what is some of the conservation work you hope to do? Doug, you're, you're super involved right now with the Maine Breeding Bird Atlas yeah, so one thing, uh, the reason that I, I was drawn to Maine Audubon, um, even you know, before I was job searching, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, the, the thing that I like about Maine Audubon is that it's uh, science-based and it's all of its approaches. You know, we, we put the science first, we want to have good data. Um, so one big project that um, I'm involved in as the outreach coordinator uh, that was launched last year, it's a, actually a project by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife called Maine Bird Atlas. Um, which I think is an important one to point out that so many people, you know, our interactions with uh, Maine IFNW tends to be, we think about, you know, the game species, the ducks, the deer, the moose, the bear, like, um, but this is, uh, I think, a a great kind of piece of evidence that, you know, IFNW is here to protect all of Maine's wildlife, um, uh, and they're putting their money where their mouth is with this project. Um, 
And so Maine Audubon, with its great history of kind of being able to uh, mobilize volunteers with the, the Loon Count celebrating its 35th year last year, uh, we were hired to get volunteers out there to uh, document the, the breeding distribution of birds across the entire state of Maine. Um, we'll look at breeding birds. We'll also do wintering birds, which has never been done in the state. Uh, breeding atlas was done from 1978 to 83, so it's going to be uh, really interesting to see the, the changes since then. There are species that um, are now breeding in the state that had never even been seen before in that first atlas. Uh, we've lost some species. There's some species that are going through huge declines. Um, all of our aerial insectivores, so tree swallows. Actually, we were, we were just looking at the first year's results um, and comparing to the results of the first atlas. And um, in the top 10 species showing the greatest declines, and of course, you know, we are, we're only one year in. We'll, we'll hopefully fill in some, a lot more gaps. Um, but some of the species with the greatest declines were species like swallows. So um, tree swallows, cliff swallows, and I think barn swallows were all in the, um, certainly in the top 10. And those are all, again, aerial insectivores. And so that means insect populations are going way down, which people have probably seen in the headlines recently, you know. Um, with bats, with the decline in like the little brown bat. It's yeah, very noticeable. So Yep, so bats are definitely declining as well, um, more tied to uh, white nose syndrome, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we're, we're really losing kind of this uh, one of the, you know, bottom of the food chain kind of concepts, which ties into more work that Maine Audubon's doing with uh, Bringing Nature Home as a project, um, kind of a spinoff of a book uh, by Douglas Talme, um of that title. And it's, it's the idea that we need to be supporting more native plants on the landscape, those Native plants support the native insects, and those native insects are the food for um, a lot of our birds and, and other wildlife. So, you know, we can put up all the bird feeders we want, but the only way we're going to support the next generation of birds is, you know, by starting at that bottom of the food chain and having things like native plants. Um, so by... Uh, Plant, by planting native plants, we need to preserve that bottom of the food chain. We have more invasives, and and you know the the truth is that as um, more and more the state becomes developed, um, which you don't have to look far to see, um, these little patches in our backyard are going to become more and more important. Um, especially, you know, it's amazing what birds can thrive in tiny little backyards, um, and the only way that they can do that is if they have the food that they need to be raising their young. And again, it's not coming from bird feeders, it's coming from the native plants. Um, so all those, those little biting insects that sometimes bug us are actually, you know, that's, that's what these birds are, are feeding their young. Um, and they'll do a better job controlling those, the, the birds, the bats, um, they'll do a better job controlling those insects than whatever terrible chemicals people uh, want to spray. I should say though, can anybody, anybody, any guesses out there what we think the biggest increase is? So we don't know for sure, but if we're, um, we have a pretty good idea what we think we the know. species with the largest increase from 1983 has been? Ticks. 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 Yeah, thank you. Turkeys. Somebody said it. It's the turkey. Yeah, turkeys. Turkey. This guy. Uh, <laughs> turkeys were almost extirpated from Maine. Um, they were. They were extirpated from Maine. Um, in the late 60s and have yeah. been reintroduced and now I'm sure there's one probably walking by the building right now. <laughs> Although in, that's a kind of a rare case because a lot of the movement around the state was created by biologists that trapped them and moved them. Right. Uh, but they're, they're supposed to be here and so once they were returned they, they have flourished as you know I saw 20 today at Gills and Farm. So. Yeah. I think I have time for one more question and one thing I wanted you both to touch on is um, you talked about birding being a great solitary activity, but it's also, uh, there's this great camaraderie in it. And a lot of outdoor, I'm sure a lot of the people here are birders, but maybe some are not. And, and talk a little bit about that, because other outdoor activities like fishing and hunting, fishermen don't want to give up their honey hole, and hunters don't want to tell anyone where their hunting mm. grounds are, but birders are just like waiting when there's a rare bird or another bird to share with other birders. Yeah, I mean, I, I think birding is fun because it's for everyone. I mean, there are a lot of folks who 
uh, are in it to not be social, frankly. You know, they want to be able to walk in the woods and um, have an activity they can do without needing other folks around. But, uh, I, you know, I have tons of great friendships from birding. Um, and partly it's because you need someone to share gas money with when you're driving to somewhere far away. Um, but, but you're right that they're really, you know, it's not, it's not consumptive. And a bird isn't your bird. It's shared by everyone who sees it. And so um, getting people onto a bird or all going as a group to see things or just to go out there is a real sort of, um, it's at, at the heart of birding. And it's one of the funnest parts. It's just blown me away when I've gone to do these stories that we've talked about and seen a crowd of birders and they're almost waiting to help somebody who's driving up to show them where the bird right. is. And it's worth saying, like, we've been talking about, you know, some of these more extremes because they're more uh, <laughs> maybe fun to talk about. But, you know, uh, this idea of birding, um, you know, people always ask what's the difference between birding and bird watching. And I think, you know, birding is actually that pursuit, the, the sport of bird watching. Um, you know, it's, it's going out to actually see these things. Um, but even for, you know, people, it's amazing the number of houses you buy, you drive by that have bird feeders. You know, birds just have this kind of awe-inspiring kind of ability about them that that humble feeling I was talking about earlier that, you know, we think like, you know, a little bird like a black-capped chickadee can survive Maine's winter is just remarkable. And then uh, the other thing is they're so accessible. Um, you know, I would, I would be a, you know, large carnivore specialist if I could, but I can't go out and see <laughs> bobcats every day or mountain lions or, um, but birds, you know, we could step outside and watch the, the pigeon flock out here. And, and even in a flock of pigeons, there's some amazing behaviors, just watching their maneuverability as flocks in flight. Like, um, there's, they're accessible to everyone almost everywhere you go. And things like the Maine Birds Facebook group with now, it's somewhere over 23,000 members um, is kind of great proof of yeah. the, the attraction that birds have to people. Yeah. I think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. I'm going to start right over here. Hey, Doug. Hey. I know so many stories about Doug. I wasn't sure which one to bring up, but... Um, I did go get to see the great black hawk in Deering, and it was in October, and it just started pouring. Like, it was just one of those cold fall days. I mind my own business looking at the hawk, and I look over, and I see the shivering mass in this in the umbrella. It says, shoot, Doug has this lens as long as my arm. And I'm looking, and I'm like, that's Doug. Because I saw his lens as a light gray, where most lenses are black. So I go over and I'm like, hey, is that you, Doug, under the umbrella, you know? So he was there like day and night practically taking pictures of that. And the only reason I remembered his lens being this off color, because he was at my house three years ago when I had seen a rare Western... Um, Rufus. Rufus. Well, that hasn't been determined yet. I have not got a determination yet on that. And I remember him being in a nice warm house, taking these great and phenomenal pictures of the uh, Rufus hummingbird. By the way, it was his email that said, don't put your bird feeders away. I'm like, all right, so I got mine back out two days later. I had, the, I had this Western hummingbird, so. Yeah, that go. was great proof of outreach working for Maine Audubon. We, we wrote a, a blog post, so a ruby-throated hummingbird show up in May, they leave by October, but after that is when these rare Western hummingbirds will show up in Maine. So I had done a blog post and said, you know, keep your hummingbird feeders up later, um, you know, see if we can attract one of these. Because we know they're out on the landscape. They're, they're finding, you know, flowers that are still in bloom. Um, and they tend to be drawn to, to feeders when they're left up. Um, and, yeah, it was just two days or so after we, we posted that article that um, Carol Jean sent us the, the message as she had one. And um, despite what the records committee says, it's, it was a rufus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to count it for my list, so. Um. Was there a question over here? It was a request, actually, um, that you write for the paper, uh, and there are people who couldn't fit in here tonight. Will you be kind enough to collaborate with these two gentlemen and get the closure points paper? We'll do better than that. Uh, Chief photographer Greg Reck is making a video of this evening, so your friends can go online to our website which hopefully they do most days of the week. <laughs> and they can watch the video from this. I think it'll be posted tomorrow. It might be a better closing, but maybe that's uh, in, in referencing, you know, getting this out there into the news more. It's maybe a good chance to um, 
give a quick round of applause to Deirdre yeah. for, for covering all the all of these rare birds, for answering those phone calls, for kind of, um, you know, it's it's been much longer than those, those rare birds. I remember we were talking earlier about that 2015 article about young birders in Maine. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's been awesome to see this uh, snowball and see that the Press Herald has been so supportive of getting people talking about, uh, you know, the importance of, of these birds that are showing up in the state. So dear God, Press Herald. Uh, well, wildlife is cool, right? We live in a state where there's, we're so fortunate to have abundant wildlife. And, yeah. you know, my theory is you, you write about it, people are going to want to read it. Yep. I think there's a question here. Oh. Ooh. Hang on, I'm coming to you with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> this is when we steal the black hog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Does that mean it's, we're done? Uh -huh. Well, we can hear you, so. Okay, well, my question is about the vagrant birds and, and especially the black hawk. When they do get in their unnatural habitat and find themselves in strange places, do, are they able to find their food source, a food, food source that they can, you know, survive on or, or whatever? It must be different than what they're used to. Yeah, so the great black hawk was a really fun example to see, uh, how, you know, this bird was in an area that it never would have otherwise occurred in and was eating prey that it never would have encountered before. So. When it showed up in August, it was mostly raiding birds' nests. Um, there were some amazing photos of it going into a tree. Um, it found an American goldfinch nest, and it was plucking eggs out of the nest. Um, <laughs> Aww. 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 <laughs> but the black hawk. Um, and then you gotta when, eat. You gotta eat. When it showed up in Portland, it was mostly eating squirrels. Um, oh. you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait till the next one. Wait till the next one. Yeah. Um, but what's, what's really interesting about that is that most of the squirrels it wasn't killing. Um, most of the squirrels were roadkill, and it was going over and picking up the roadkill squirrels. So um, the, the great black hawk is in this genus called Buteogallus, which have these really long legs, and they're one of their closest relatives are called crab hawks. And so they actually feed in the intertidal zone. So it was really fun to think that, like, you know, bet between August and November that this bird was, like, catching lobsters in Casco mm. Bay somewhere. But I want um, to say quickly that it moved from squirrels onto rats <laughs> in yeah. Portland. So nobody, there's no awe uh for that. It's just a plus. Yeah, seeing it was eating rats. It actually stole two pigeons from a local Cooper's Hawk. So the Cooper's Hawk had killed pigeons, and then it would take them from it. Um, it was seen... One of the only uh, uh, other native prey items that it took was uh, uh, what looked like red-backed vole, or one of the voles, um, when it was hunting along 295. Um, and in that same idea, not to go into this too much, but I got a little obsessed with this bird, um, <laughs> was uh, seeing native species reacting to it. So when we first found it in, in uh, Bitterford Pool, or, or Fortune's Rocks, it was because I heard robins freaking out. They were giving this alarm call that robins do, and that's what cued off uh, for me to look in this, this little wet area. Um, and then even when it was in Deering Oaks, like the, the, there was a local red tail that gave it lots of grief. Uh, and one of the most fun things to watch was um, the, the live gray squirrels um, would investigate. And there's this really cool behavior that in the presence of a novel predator, um, the first time they, they see something, they're going to test how close can they get? So we saw these, you know, very adventurous squirrels that were like, you know, kind of edging out on the branches at this thing, like how, you know, testing it because they had never seen this thing. So, um, and, and there's a lot of difference. I mean, um, vagrant birds show up a lot to varying degrees. Sometimes they can't find food. It's, it's, you know, more common than not that they actually don't survive. Um, but sometimes they do. And I think another st one cool story that's happening right now. Um, is a bird called a little egret, uh, which you can see if you come to Gilsland Farm uh, in Falmouth, the Audubon. So uh, come on, stop at the store, buy a membership, and then go out into the marsh. Um, this is, so we have a bird here called a, a snowy egret, which is a small white heron type bird. Um, and they migrate uh, between up here in the springtime, summer, and then down south, Central America, South America, Florida, wherever. Gulf Coast. Uh, I defer to Doug on all my things. Um, uh, per, in the winter, so they move up and down. 
in um, Europe and Africa, there's another bird called the little egret. Um, and they basically do the same thing. They move um, up and down between those two places. Somehow, some way, um, a or multiple little egrets made their way from, um, it, we're actually unclear whether it happened from, from Africa to South America or uh, Europe to Maine, um, but showed up in Maine. And you know these birds are not from here. You know this is not their territory. But this little egret has returned to Gilson Farm for five years in a row. So they have just adapted to now. They just are like, oh, well, I'm just going to roll with this, and I'm going to migrate to South America, and are coming back and forth. And so sometimes they 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 do survive. And so come on, see that little egret. It's the one. We actually saw two this spring. Yeah. Um, so the. Real quick addition is we, it's, it's assumed that it's in their fall migration, so they're going from Europe to northern Africa, and then they can catch the trade winds. So the only way that a, a large bird like that is likely to make a, a, a trip across the Atlantic is if it's got a good tailwind that's going to help push it. So it would be going against the, the um, prevailing winds if it did it across the... Uh, North Atlantic, which we know some some birds definitely do it, um, but there's a, a number of uh, little egret records from the West Indies that show that they're, they're like that golden plover, right? Did you see that? Ooh. Sorry, one of the few birds that I've seen in Maine that Doug hasn't is a European golden plover. So I try to remind him at all times, yes. <laughs> including including on stage in yeah. front of people. And then uh, red-billed <laughs> tropic bird is uh, yeah. another bird, yeah. as the name implies, it should be down in the tropics. This bird has been showing up on. Uh, first Matinicus, now Seal Island, which are mid-coast Maine. And I think this is year 16 that that bird has shown up. What's interesting, it's a southern hemisphere breeder. So our summers, it's winter. So this bird's got it made that it's hanging out you know, in the tropics um, all, <laughs> all of our winter, then comes up here. And it just it harasses turns all winter, or excuse me, all our summer. It's winter. Uh, hmm. All summer long. I think the lights coming up is my cue. Thank you both for joining us for making birding cool. Thank you. You're great ambassadors. Thank you to our sponsors.